Hello, and welcome to November's Win Feline Foundations webinar. Uh, we're really pleased to have you here today. Uh, as you probably know, November is Diabetes Month, and we're focusing on uh, diabetes mellitus in cats, and the topic is Diabetes Mellitus, Why Cats Are Different. And part of our um, campaign to raise money that we call for our Cures for Cats uh, campaign is focused on raising money for health studies uh, on diabetes in cats. And you're welcome to donate today uh, or through the end of the year. Uh, that's donate to Win Feline Foundation's um, uh, website at winfelinefoundation.org or you can text GIVE to 973-834-7194. And our speaker today is Dr. Audrey Cook. Um, Dr. Cook graduated from the University of Edinburgh and she also did uh, her internship and residency in uh, veterinary, small animal internal medicine uh, here in the United States and has practiced in private practice and is now a uh, professor at Texas A&M College of Veterinary Medicine with uh, special interest in endocrinology, gastroenterology, and interventional radiology. And, uh, you know, I'd probably say even more so uh, that Dr. Cook is a cat lover. Uh, we love the fact she's from Scotland and she loves my favorite um, music group, Run Rig. But I will turn our webinar over today uh, to Dr. Cook about feline diabetes. Great. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So yes, today we're going to talk about feline diabetes, why cats are different. This is my conflict of interest disclosure slide. I do have professional relationships with the companies listed here, but none of those relationships are going to impact the content of my talk today. So I'm going to use the time that we have to cover three major issues. The first thing I'm going to discuss is the journey to diabetes mellitus. So how do cats become a diabetic? I think it's important to understand that because then we can understand some of the challenges we have managing our feline diabetics. We're then going to talk about diet and a group of new very exciting hormones called the incretins. And then with the time we have remaining, we're going to talk about diabetic remission what we mean by that and how best to achieve diabetic remission. So I'm going to take a second just to make sure we're all on the same page as far as what it means when we say a patient is a diabetic or has diabetes mellitus. I think it's easiest to describe diabetes as hypoglycemic condition resulting from the absolute or relative deficiency of insulin. And we use the term absolute or relative because that's kind of sort of how we think about diabetes mellitus in our veterinary patients. So absolute insulin deficiency means you're not making any insulin and we don't expect you to ever start making any insulin again. We usually see that in our canine patients and that's a pretty good model for type 1 diabetes mellitus in people. And then there are individuals and feline patients who can become diabetic because of a relative insulin deficiency. So they can make some, but they can't make enough. And that's basically what we mean when we talk about a patient having type 2 diabetes mellitus. So in veterinary medicine, we've somewhat traditionally said, well, dogs get type 1 and cats get type 2. It's actually a little bit simplistic. And the reality is cats are not quite as easy categorized as that. Because for all that our feline patients may have a diabetes mellitus that mimics type 2 diabetes in people, these cats still usually require insulin and are therefore insulin dependent. So why do cats become diabetic? Well, we do think that for the majority of cats, certainly well more than half of the cats we see with diabetes mellitus, the underlying driver is sustained insulin resistance. And this gives them these very strong similarities to type 2 diabetes mellitus in people. So I want to take a second to explain what we mean when we use the terms insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity. What are those terms actually trying to convey? Well, a person's sensitivity or 
the flip side, resistance to insulin, essentially is a way of trying to describe how much insulin it takes to get the job done. And very simply put, you can imagine that insulin's job is to move ingested energy into storage compartments. And one of those jobs is moving glucose from the bloodstream into cells. And so we've got some glucose and we have to get it into the cell. An insulin molecule is going to arrive and the glucose is going to move. When a patient who is insulin responsive has good insulin sensitivity, it doesn't take a lot of insulin to get the job done. Now, let's think about a patient who has insulin resistance. And so that means that the cell does not respond as well to the request from insulin to let the glucose in. So the insulin arrives and the glucose doesn't move. And so what the body will do, at least initially, is send more insulin. It'll send more insulin and that hopefully will be enough to get the job done. This patient is able to maintain a target normal blood glucose concentration, but it does so by sending out significantly more insulin. This is insulin resistance. If we think about our feline patients, there are numerous processes that can make them insulin resistant. And this slide summarizes the commonest. I don't have time to talk about all of these, but I do want to highlight some important ones. Without a doubt, obesity is probably the number one driver of insulin resistance in our feline patients. Obesity has some very complex interactions with the effects of insulin, partly from the hormones produced by the fat cells and partly from the inflammatory condition that obesity tends to drive. So obesity is a really major player. We also get insulin resistance secondary to some other endocrine disorders, such as hyperthyroidism, hypersomatotrophism, sometimes referred to as acromegaly, and Cushing's disease. Hypersomatotrophism and Cushing's disease aren't particularly common, but hypothyroidism certainly is. Now, I mentioned that obesity causes insulin resistance through various mechanisms, including inflammatory conditions, and other inflammatory states will also trigger some degrees of insulin resistance. These may be sterile inflammatory diseases like chronic pancreatitis or inflammatory diseases that are driven by infection, such as stomatitis or, or chronic dental disease. But inflammatory and infectious diseases are going to impact the responsiveness to insulin. And then there's some things that we can give our patients that can cause insulin resistance, like exogenous glucocorticoids or progestins. These things also impact the cell's ability to respond to insulin. So as we showed before on that other slide, the body's first response to insulin resistance is to just go ahead and make more insulin. So step one is increased insulin secretion. This means we put out more insulin to keep our blood glucose where it needs to be. So we have a patient who's making more insulin than it needed to before in order to get the job done. Now, when we secrete one molecule of insulin, the pancreas co-secretes another molecule of islet amyloid polypeptide, sometimes called amylin. Now, the biological properties and functions of amylin are not well understood, but essentially one molecule of insulin, one molecule of amylin. And for most species, including the dog, amylin isn't problematic because it's very soluble. And so the IAPP just drifts away from the pancreas and doesn't cause any problems. But in a small number of other species, particularly cats and people, this islet amyloid polypeptide is not very soluble. And it basically gets stuck or clogged in the pancreas. We get a condition we call pancreatic amyloidosis. Now this is really unfortunate because the amyloidosis makes it a little bit more difficult for the beta cells to function effectively. And so now they can't put out quite as much insulin as they would like to as a result of this pancreatic amyloidosis. Now, chances are blood sugar is now slightly higher than it would like to be. Patient isn't diabetic, but blood sugars are starting to drift up because we've got the sustained insulin resistance We've got the compromised insulin secretion. And so now we have a patient who has relative insulin deficiency. 
Now we sometimes see these cats on a wellness visit and we see a blood sugar that's above the target range. I always think target range for a cat should max out at about 130 milligrams per deciliter. And this may be a happy, friendly cat whose blood sugar is 160, 165. Now, we may look at that cat and say, ah, it's stress. It's just stress, hyperglycemia, nothing to worry about. But I think it's really important that we look at that patient and say, do you really think he's stressed? Or could we potentially be looking at a cat who now has essentially what we call preclinical diabetes mellitus? So the blood sugar is not high enough to cause the clinical signs that we see with diabetes mellitus, but this cat's insulin production is no longer what it needs to be to keep blood glucose in target 24-7. So the cat's going to experience progressive hyperglycemia. And when the blood sugar gets over about 200, chances are the cat is still not yet clinical for diabetes mellitus because that doesn't happen until blood sugars in cats are often about 250. What does happen though is a process called glucose toxicity. Now the toxicity suggests that blood sugars must be terribly high, but that's not true. Glucose toxicity happens when blood sugars are relatively modestly increased. And glucose toxicity unfortunately hurts the beta cells. And those beta cells and those islets are going to undergo apoptosis, which is a quiet, peaceful death, or they're going to turn themselves off. They're going to shut down. And the cat is going to make less insulin. And so now we have a cat who's putting out some, or maybe none, insulin. Blood sugar is now moving higher and higher. It exceeds that magic 250, which is the renal threshold. And now we have a cat with overt diabetes mellitus. I do want to take a, a second or two to explain a little bit more about glucose toxicity. So we tend to think in terms of any black time the blood sugar is over about 200, we're getting some toxic effects from that hyperglycemia. Now remember, you can have a blood sugar that's over 200 if you're a cat, but less than 250, so you have no clinical signs to tell anybody that you are a diabetic. But that hyperglycemia is toxic to many cells in the body. It'll damage the nerves, and this is what drives the peripheral neuropathy that we sometimes see in diabetic cats. And it is also very damaging to those beta islet cells. Those cells, are under, under, oof, those cells are going to undergo what's called apoptosis. And these images here show beta um, biopsies, beta cell biopsies from cats treated with high levels of glucose on the bottom or a saline placebo. And as you can see, there's far less of those healthy beta cells in the cats who are exposed to hyperglycemia. So those images come from a paper that to my mind is absolutely startling. This was a, some, a study done in Europe and published in 2009. Very, very simple study. They took a group of cats, some of them were used as controls, and another group of cats were exposed to hyperglycemia. They did this by putting in jug catheters and pumping in highly concentrated dextrose to keep their blood glucose concentrations between 450 and 540 milligrams per deciliter for just 10 days. So a relatively short study. What they saw was an initial spike in insulin production by these cats. And again, these are young, healthy cats. So initially they put out more insulin to try and regulate that blood glucose, but they couldn't. By day five, their pancreases shut down. They completely stop making any insulin by day five. When they biopsied the pancreases in these cats after 10 days of this hyperglycemia, they found an 80% decrease in insulin positive tissues. So many of the beta cells had completely turned off. When they actually counted the number of beta cells that were present, that number was down by 50%. So half the beta cells had actually died in that 10-day exposure to substantial hyperglycemia. This is glucose toxicity. So if you're a beta cell and you're exposed to a hyperglycemic environment, and remember, it doesn't have to be all that high, it might be just about 200 milligrams or so, you've kind of got two choices. Some of these beta cells are gonna undergo apoptosis, and that's essentially a programmed cell death. It's not an inflammatory response. The cells simply turn themselves off and they die. Some of the cells will shut down. 
I think of them as simply going into hiding. They're going to turn themselves off and sit very quietly and see if conditions improve. So when we meet a cat with diabetes mellitus, we often don't know how many cells are gone and how many cells are simply shut down and hiding. We do know that the longer the cells are shut down and hiding, the more chance they have of essentially losing all hope and undergoing apoptosis. We also know though, that if we can come into this situation and we can achieve euglycemia, we can bring that blood glucose concentration below the magic 200, then some of those beta cells are capable of recovery. And this is what lets some of our diabetic cats go into what we call diabetic remission. So that's kind of the story behind insulin resistance and how that drives diabetes mellitus in cats. But there are other things that influence the possibility of a cat becoming a diabetic. And there are some pretty clear genetic predispositions. If you look at some of the research work, particularly out of Australia, usually about 25 to 33% of the cats in any Australian study on diabetes mellitus are Burmese because those Australian and European Burmese have a tremendous genetic tendency to become diabetic. Now luckily, American Burmese are made of quite different stock and so their risk does not seem to be particularly high. But this does tell us that genetics can play a role. There's also been some very specific work done to look at particular genes that may be causative in diabetes mellitus. One that's particularly interesting is a polymorphism in the melanocortin-4 receptor. And this has been identified in obese cats and obese people with type 2 diabetes mellitus. If this receptor isn't programmed to work properly, one of the things that happens is you never feel like you've eaten enough, hence the obesity. So affected individuals always feel as though they just need to go up and get seconds. They are constantly hungry because those feelings of satiety are never being appeased. Another thing that happens if this receptor isn't programmed quite properly is that they don't have the normal incretin responses to food. And we'll talk more about the incretins in just a little while. Another reason why cats can become diabetic without a doubt is chronic pancreatitis. There is good evidence that chronic inflammation of the exocrine parts of the pancreas, so the parts of the pancreas that make digestive enzymes, if those parts of the pancreas are chronically inflamed, we're going to get fibrosis and we're going to get scarring that eventually is going to start to damage those beta islets. And so for some cats, it does look as though chronic pancreatitis plays a significant role. So I mentioned the incretins when I talked about cats with a melanocortin-4 receptor polymorphism. But I'm going to talk a little bit now about diet and the incretins because this is one of the things that makes feline diabetes so particularly interesting. I have to admit that there are various schools of thought when it comes to how best to feed our feline diabetics. There is unfortunately limited hard evidence, but lots and lots of firm opinions. When we're thinking about our goals looking at our feline diabetics, I do think no matter what approach you have from a nutritional standpoint, we're all working with the same goals in mind. Number one, we want to optimize glycemic control. We want our diabetics to be as close to normal as we can realistically hope to achieve. It's also really important that we make nutritional plans that are going to support our patients in achieving a target optimum body condition score and also maintaining good muscle mass. So target weight, target BCS, and target muscle condition score. And then there may be some evidence that we can influence the likelihood of diabetic remission depending on the diets that we choose. When we look at the feline diabetes and diet arguments, it kind of falls into two camps. There's the high fiber, the pro fiber argument. And this tended to be a very popular approach, probably in the 80s, then the 90s. It's kind of fallen by the wayside lately. But the arguments that support using fiber for our feline diabetics do include the fact that fiber is going to support feelings of satiety. And when cats are eating, their decisions about when they've had enough are partly driven by absolute caloric intake, but also substantially influenced by the simple volume of food in their stomach. And so foods that are less energy dense, foods that have more fiber, promote those feelings of satiety 
and that can be very useful. We also know that fiber is going to slow the release of other nutrients. They're going to be digested more gradually. They're going to cross the digestive tract and enter the bloodstream more slowly. We're going to get slower transit times through the small intestine. And those things might be advantageous for more gradual release of ingested energy. There's also some pretty good evidence that fiber, particularly soluble fibers, may improve peripheral insulin sensitivity in people. This is complicated. It's probably got something to do with changing the GI microbiome, so, so complicated stuff indeed. But there certainly are some good arguments to support fiber supplementation for individuals with diabetes mellitus. There's quite a few papers that looked at the impact of, uh, of fiber supplementation in diabetic cats, and I've just picked one just as an example. This was published in 2000 in JAVMA and came from a group based primarily out of Davis. And this is a study using relatively robust concentrations of fiber. So they had 16 cats with diabetes mellitus, and it was a randomized um, controlled crossover study. And these cats were fed um, either 12% insoluble fiber, so very, very robust fiber concentrations, or a very low fiber diet for 24 weeks. What they did find in this, um, the, so the carbohydrate content for both diets was high. It was a more than 30% carbohydrate content diet with 6.1 grams of fiber in the high fiber diet and just 1.1 grams of fiber per 100 kilocalories of metabolizable energy in the lower fiber diet. They did find that they got lower pre- and postprandial blood glucose concentrations in the cats on the high fiber group. But the overall impact was fairly modest, and there was no difference on hemoglobin A1C concentrations or overall insulin requirements. Let's switch now to the low carbohydrate argument. The arguments that support this is number one, cats are really not designed to eat carbohydrates. Cats can be regarded as most definitely obligate carnivores. They are very well adapted for what we call gluconeogenesis, and that means the ability of the liver to make glucose from amino acids. They really aren't expecting to consume carbohydrates. Cats also have very different endocrine responses to ingested carbohydrates than species such as dogs and people that are much more naturally omnivorous. There's also some pretty good evidence that we get improved glycemic control with cats who are on low carbohydrate diets both normal cats and cats with diabetes mellitus. Again, there's numerous reports that have looked at the impact of carbohydrate restriction in cats with diabetes mellitus. I'm just going to share one of these reports with you. This was published in 2006 in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. And this report described a group of 63 cats with diabetes mellitus. And they spent either 16 weeks on a low carbohydrate diet that was 12% of metabolizable energy or a more standard carbohydrate content diet which was 26% of metabolizable energy. The low carbohydrate diet was also very low in fiber at 0.1 grams. The other diet was more normal at about 3.1 grams of fiber per 100 kilocalories of metabolizable energy. The low carbohydrate food used in this study was actually simply um, a commercial kitten food. And the, um, the standard diet it was compared to is one that's a fiber supplemented diet that's not unusually, that's quite routinely used for feline diabetes mellitus. In this study, they looked at the remission rates for the two groups of cats as one of their important endpoints. And they did find increased remission in the cats who are fed the carbohydrate restricted diet. 68% of those cats achieved remission versus just 41% of the cats on the higher fiber, not carb-restricted diet. No matter where you stand on those, on those two, two viewpoints as far as carbohydrate restriction versus fiber supplementation, I do think it's important to bear in mind that many of the, the standard kind of store brand cat foods that are available probably are somewhat problematic because often they're very high in carbohydrates. My very talented colleague, Deb Zaran, once said to me, leaving your cat alone at home with an ad lib bucket of an inexpensive store brand dry food is like leaving your teenager home alone all day with a large box of donuts. It's going to be really hard to stop eating. 
Other concerns we have with some um, kind of standard store-bought cat foods may be that the protein concentration may also be a bit borderline. And there's good evidence to suggest that even though cats can live on moderate protein diets, they don't tend to thrive unless they're on robust protein diets. We know that protein is going to impact feelings of satiety, and protein is going to be key as far as maintaining effective muscle mass. And muscle is a great sink for insulin, so muscle is a great way of maintaining effective insulin sensitivity. So if we think about a high protein, high fat, low net carbohydrate diet, which for me usually means a carbohydrate content that's less than about 14% of metabolizable energy, these style of diets do kind of mimic what cats would mostly eat if they were killing and catching their own food. And these diets are going to support lean muscle, which is going to limit sarcopenia, which is the age-related loss of muscle mass. These kind of diets are going to potentially improve insulin sensitivity. And there's also good evidence that these diets are going to be optimal for supporting beta cell health. And one of the reasons that these diets are so particularly useful as far as keeping the beta cells functioning and happy reflects the role of the incretins. So I always love to talk about the incretins because as a person who loves endocrinology and gastroenterology and cats, the incretins are absolutely fascinating. So the incretins are a group of hormones, there's many members of this group, that are secreted by the gastrointestinal tract. You can basically think that there are special enterocytes, so special cells that lie in the GI tract that make these particular hormones. And there's two I want to introduce you to today. One is glucose-dependent insulotrophic peptide, GIP. The other one, and this is actually more interesting of the two, is glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. Now these hormones, these incretins, are released by these special enterocytes in response to the arrival of nutrients within the GI tract lumen. And actually the cells that make these remarkable hormones look and behave a little bit like taste buds. So you can think of these cells as actually tasting what you have eaten. So before that food has been digested and absorbed, these cells are able to send a message back to the rest of the body to say, aha, this is what she's eaten. This is what we need to get ourselves ready for. And the hormones that are released by these special cells are tremendously metabolically important. They regulate our responses to food. They send messages to the pancreas, to the liver, the GI tract, and the brain. The more important of these two is glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. The cells that release this are scattered throughout the GI tract in cats, which is slightly different to people where they tend to be mostly in the distal small intestine. But GLP-1 really gives a quick and useful heads up to the liver to stop gluconeogenesis. So if it's been some time since you last ate, particularly if you're a cat, your liver will be quite busy converting amino acids into glucose to keep your blood sugar on target. And then you eat something, the GLP-1 knows that you've eaten something, sends a message to the liver to say, ha, ah, energy is coming, you can turn off gluconeogenesis. So the liver turns that process down and waits for the new calories to arrive. The GLP-1 also sends an important message to the pancreas and tells those beta cells, ha, ah, calories are coming, get ready. And so those beta cells will actually start to release insulin before those ingested nutrients have entered the bloodstream. It's a very, very important heads up. The other thing that the GLP-1 does when it's sending a message to the pancreas also has a powerful trophic effect upon those beta cells. And so it tells those beta cells to go ahead and make insulin, but also keeps them well. It encourages them to thrive and divide. The GLP-1 will also send a message to the brain to say, ha, huh, food is coming you can turn off those feelings of hunger. And so GLP-1 is very important when it comes to feelings of satiety, feeling like you've had enough to eat. When we look at the incretins, there's been lots of work done to see which foods in particular have the most impact as far as the release of those incretins. Now, in the omnivorous species, so us and dogs, and this is me with my beloved dog, Texas, Carbohydrates and fats 
the most powerful of the secretagogues for the incretins. Proteins play a pretty small role. And that reflects the fact that carbohydrates are probably designed to be a substantial part of the human diet. Now, let's think about it from the feline perspective. Because if you're a cat, those triggers are very, very different. In a cat, the triggers for those really important hormones are proteins and fats. Carbohydrates play a very, very small role. And in fact, carbohydrates don't trigger the release of G GIP at all in cats. Proves the point that cats really are not designed to be eating carbohydrates. Cats really are designed to be living primarily off of protein and fat. And so my thoughts on diet. I do think we have good evidence that cats are probably designed to have high protein diets. So think in terms of diets where proteins are about 40% of the calories. I also think that cats do better. I think they're better adapted for low carbohydrate diets, which means carbohydrate diet, carbohydrate concentrations that are about less than 14% of metabolizable energy. And I also think there's a role for modest amounts of fiber for our diabetic feline patients, partly because of feelings of satiety and because of the positive impacts on the GI microbiome. We're going to take a little break here and we're going to hear a little bit more about our Cures for Cats campaign. Hi, I'm back and I am here to tell you more about our Cures for Cats campaign this fall. And WIN's mission is to fund health research and improve the future health of cats, finding answers for such serious diseases like diabetes in cats. And, you know, the line up there that says one in every 230 cats will develop diabetes during their lifetime is definitely a very serious issue. Um, the incidence is increasing in cats and the fact that 463 million people in, worldwide have diabetes. So this is a serious issue and we need to find more answers, especially for our, our cat friends. And so we help, we're we here to help raise money um, for uh, research and, and with our Cures for Cats campaign on diabetes, one dollar will be matched by another dollar and it helps, you know, uh, for two dollars. And we have, we're trying to raise $15,000 where we'll have a $15,000 match that equals uh, $30,000 and that's really at least one uh, health study that we can look to improve cats lives so please consider uh, donating and you can do that by text give to 973-834-7194 and with some uh, housekeeping uh, there will be questions and answers at the end of the webinar and I also want to say a big, huge thank you to the Cat Fanciers Association and the International Cat Association, who have been longtime supporters and donors um, to Win Feline Foundation. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Cook, and thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Fair. So we're going to move on to talk about diabetic remission. So this is a somewhat controversial topic. And one thing I would say is that this is not for every cat. And similarly, this is not for every owner. This is an excellent read for those of you who routinely work with, um, with feline patients. This was published in um, 2014 from a team primarily based at the Royal Veterinary College in London with some input from the very talented Dr. Graves at the University of Illinois. What they looked at was they looked at all the publications that have talked about feline remission and they come up with this very organized systematic review. What they did was what's called a, a Cochrane Collaboration Guidelines. And so this is a, a method for looking at, at publications and trying to weigh the evidence that's been shared in publications. Um, so we can see if we can come to some hard conclusions. They used um, five internists to look at 22 studies that discussed diabetic remission. 
And then again, they kind of critique them from the perspective of how much information is provided about the things that will influence remission rate and what information can we reliably derive regarding patient characteristics that might support the onset of diabetic remission. As I said, there were 20 studies included in this retrospective um, review. 14 of the studies looked at various insulin types. Four of the studies looked at diet. Um, nine of them looked at specific diagnostics that might be used to predict remission, and five of them focused on patient characteristics. What they found in this review was that, generally speaking, the evidence in the publications they looked at was moderate to poor. One of the concerns that was raised was substantial bias, particularly to do with lack of randomization or blinding. So concern that cats who are put into treatment groups may have been assigned with some, uh, some element of, of bias to try and improve numbers. Many of the studies were also limited by somewhat small sample sizes. Another issue that um, this systematic review identified was lack of criteria for both the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus and then very poor definitions of what remission actually meant. There were some things that could be concluded from the data that was examined in the review. It did look as though cats who had a lower blood glucose at the time of diagnosis of diabetes mellitus and who were not hypercholesterolemic were more likely to go into remission. They also found that cats who had a lower mean 12-hour blood glucose after a couple of weeks of insulin therapy were also more likely to go into remission. And cats with higher IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1 concentrations, about one to three weeks after the time of diagnosis, were also more likely to go into remission. In some ways, though, what they discovered from this was actually they had simply identified factors that would make us think the cat still had some ability to make small amounts of insulin at the time of diagnosis. That would explain many of these findings. It would explain a lower blood glucose at the time of diagnosis, would explain the lack of hypercholesterolemia, would explain an improved response to exogenous insulin, and would explain the improvement in their IGF-1 concentrations. So it does look as though cats who are, who are diabetic, who are still able to make small amounts of insulin at the time of diagnosis, are more likely to go into remission, which isn't particularly surprising. We certainly can conclude, though, that without doubt, the feline pancreas is capable of recovery. Usually, this is going to happen within about 90 days of the time of diagnosis. Having said that, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who had a diabetic cat for four years that then went into remission. So we can never say never. We also do know that diabetes mellitus can essentially wax and wane in the sense that cats can go into remission and then become insulin um, dependent and then go into remission and then become insulin dependent. One of the ways to think about this is to think in terms of the cat is always essentially a diabetic. There are just periods of time when that cat will require exogenous insulin and periods of time when the cat may not. But many of us now do think that the diabetes never really goes away, that once a cat has ever required exogenous insulin, that cat is essentially always a diabetic. There are just phases in its life where it does not require exogenous insulin. I also think on the basis of this report that most of us agree that a cat needs to be off of insulin for at least four weeks and maintain new glycemia for us to say that cat has honestly and truly achieved remission. Another point that's worthwhile holding as very reliable is this idea that the quicker we can reverse the glucose toxicity, the more chance we have of preserving those beta cells that are shut down. Remember, if those cells are exposed to sustained hyperglycemia, if that blood sugar stays over 200 for weeks and weeks and months and months, those beta cells are vulnerable to undergoing apoptosis, at which point they are not coming back. So rapid control of that blood glucose really is essential. And most of us think in terms of we've probably got a couple of months before we've got irreversible loss of those beta cells. If we look at the likelihood of cats going into diabetic remission, there is a broad spectrum of data on this. I want to share just a couple of studies with you. So one study I want to share, published out of Australia in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery in 2009, described 55 cats. 
Now, the majority of these cats were new diabetic, but some of them were established diabetics. They found that 84% of the recent diabetics who were put on insulin glargine or insulin detamir went into remission. It took about six days to 10 months to achieve remission. Most of these cats were supported with pretty intensive at-home monitoring. Of the established diabetics, only about a third of those went into diabetic remission. Very different results, though, from a paper published the same year in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, um, from primarily from the Davis Group, and this described 133 diabetic cats. Most of these were new diabetics. In fact, 120 of them were new diabetics. And these cats were being managed with the protein zinc insulin formulations. None of these cats achieved remission by day 45, not one of them. Now, some of them may have been heading in that direction, but by a month and a half, nobody had actually entered remission. These cats were being monitored um, by their veterinarians. Um, they were not having intensive at-home monitoring, so the protocols for these two patient populations were substantially different. So probably somewhat in response to the data that was coming out of Australia, a group of feline practitioners met at the ABVP meeting and discussed their results with feline diabetics. And the results of this uh, very honest conversation were published in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery in 2015. And so um, nine very talented feline practitioners met and they shared their results from 282 of their feline diabetics. Some of these results actually were um, really insightful. 15% um, of these cats were euthanized within, within a week of diagnosis. I think that's not surprising because this is going to include cats who had serious comorbid conditions and it's going to include cats who had um, diabetic ketoacidosis and maybe owners with financial limitations. So 15% so were euthanized within a week. The data point that actually really did surprise me though is that only 57% of these cats were alive at three months. We should suggest that the outcomes for cats with diabetes mellitus are worse than most of us would have expected. And ironically, you're actually better off being diagnosed with lymphoma than diagnosed with diabetes mellitus based on this somewhat depressing statistic. When they looked at the number of cats who underwent remission, however, they found an average of about 26%, which did range from clinic to clinic from 8% to a high of 42%. So great data and kudos to these individuals for so honestly sharing their outcomes. If you're thinking about if this is the right thing for a diabetic cat, I do think you have to look pretty carefully at the client because the owner is going to have to be able to do a fair amount of work at home and understand quite a bit about feline diabetes mellitus. They're going to have to do some kind of home blood glucose monitoring. And we'll talk about that specifically, and there are some options that are making this a lot easier. But their clients are going to have to be invested. They're going to have to be willing and able to follow instructions because the owner is going to have to make adjustments in insulin. And they need to understand the mechanisms of diabetes mellitus and the risks involved in trying to achieve tight glycemic control. So first, find the right owner. And then second, you want to select the right patient. Ideally, you want to find a cat who has reversible insulin resistance. So this means a cat, ideally, who's had, say, recent steroid use, but who's not steroid dependent. So you can stop the steroids, and that'll make a huge difference. Um, ideally, an obese cat, because we can reverse the obesity, and that's going to take away the number one driver for feline insulin resistance. And maybe it's a cat who's got something like dental disease that needs to be addressed and can be addressed. That's going to make a huge difference. Also, your ideal patient is a cat who's going to be willing and able to tolerate a low-carbohydrate diet. I do think the evidence we have would support the use of a low-carb diet if we are using remission as one of our treatment goals. I would like to point out that an episode of diabetic ketoacidosis does not mean that the cat is incapable of going into remission. So don't exclude a cat because it presents in DKA. One thing I would pay very close attention to is things on the physical exam. One of those things in particular is any evidence at all of a peripheral neuropathy. Now, if we see a cat like this, this cat walked in 
to see its veterinarian because it wasn't walking properly and was diagnosed at that point as being a diabetic. Now we look at this cat and this cat has been hyperglycemia for weeks or months. So this cat is almost certain to not go into diabetic remission. So if there's any hint at all of diabetic neuropathy, the cat is not a good candidate for remission. The diabetic neuropathy is going to affect the hind legs first. Often the perineal nerve is the nerve that's primarily affected. And so it's really important when you first see a diabetic cat to make sure you've got some ideas about how well their hind leg nerves are, are working. One thing I will do is I will scratch along the cat's rump and see if I can get the cat to stand on tiptoe. If the cat can stand on tiptoe, that's a very, very good sign. If the cat looks like it wants to stand on tiptoe, but it can't, that could be a sign of a peripheral neuropathy. Other thing I will do with feline patients is I will try and watch the cat actually jump. And so I will make sure that there's a chair or a counter, something that's a suitable height, and put the cat on the floor. And then I will use my cat neuropathy detecting device, also known as a broom, and I will bother the cat just enough to see if it will jump. A cat should easily jump three or four feet onto a counter. If the cat struggles to do so and can't even make it onto a chair, you've got very good evidence the cat has a neuropathy, in which case diabetic remission is extremely unlikely. Other things to look for are any signs of an underlying concurrent endocrinopathy like hyperadrenal corticism or Cushing's. And the cat in this picture has folded over ears, which can be a sign of Cushing's in cats. Um, acromegaly, so hypersomatotrophism, is something else to look for. Ideally, your patient has a robust body weight, so it's, it's in very good body condition, overall good health, and no part of the history suggests chronic pancreatitis. These would be cats, I think, have a reasonable chance of achieving remission. You do have to be able to monitor blood glucose if you're going to try and strongly encourage a cat to go into diabetic remission, because one of the things we're going to do is try and maintain tight glycemic control. So traditionally, we've had clients check blood glucoses um, at home three times a day, before each insulin dose and about six to eight hours after the morning dose. And we use these parameters to make intelligent adjustments to the insulin dose. Now, up until recently, we've been relying on handheld glucometers. It's important if you're using these to have a veterinary validated model. Um, otherwise, we tend to get data points that aren't that reliable. The human devices tend to underread, and that can become very confusing. If we are using a handheld glucometer, one thing I will do is practice with the cat before I show the owner really good places to, to get enough blood to check a blood glucose. There are lots of easy spots for sampling, but the ear is my personal favorite. I'll also provide owners with um, YouTube resources because there's excellent videos of happy cats jumping up to get a blood glucose checked by an owner. And these are often very encouraging things for clients to engage with. And then it's important to let the owner reward the cat each time. And so there's lots of cat treats that have less than a calorie. So very, very safe to go ahead and give the cat a small reward each time it cooperates. In the last couple of years, though, most of us have drifted away from teaching our clients to do that and instead are reaching for these flash interstitial glucometers, like the Freestyle Libre. And this is a device that's worn continuously. It doesn't need any calibration, which is wonderful. So we can apply the device and then the client is able to measure, non-invasively measure blood glucose concentrations at home. The sensors last up to 14 days. I would say personally, in most of my feline patients, we usually get about seven to 10 days worth of data before the sensors seem to fail. And you can scan the cat and get an instant reading. You'll also get trends. And if you scan the cat at least once every eight hours, you'll get a full 24 hours of data. You can buy the reader that matches up with the sensor, or you can also simply download an app onto an iPhone so no reader is actually required. So this actually is the, the original version. The Freestyle Libre version 2 has recently emerged. I have not yet used the version 2. So we have our little sensor, little flash glucose monitoring system, and then we have our reader device. So this is a close-up of the sensor in its launching device. And so um, there's a little tiny needle that is part of the launching device that sends a little teeny tiny, very, very soft, basically like an electrode that just sits into the subcutaneous space. 
and continually monitors blood glucose concentrations. So as soon as you put the reader over the device, it will tell you right then what the interstitial glucose concentrations are. So this is a, an image of a cat who's wearing one, and I usually put them slightly more lateral on the neck. I think they sit a bit more comfortably, slightly more lateral versus perfectly dorsal like this. I will often implant them and then put a couple of spots of skin glue on the edges just to um, reduce the risk of the device becoming dislodged. It is important when you first apply the device to count to about 20 or 30 seconds to be sure that the glue that sits on the pad has a chance to dissolve and adhere effectively to the cat. I then usually put a little light wrap over that sensor. I usually use the same covers that I use for my feline feeding tubes. Um, and then you can actually read through the, the cover. If you need to, you can obviously loosen the cover if you have difficulty reading through it. But oftentimes, the readers will go through light dressings. So we're going to be monitoring our blood glucose is carefully at home. We're also going to start insulin immediately. Um, if you meet a, a diabetic cat and the owner is reluctant to start insulin, you can certainly try diet for a couple of weeks if the cat is not ketotic. You can consider oral hypoglycemics if the cat is not ketotic. But every day that cat is hyperglycemic, we reduce the chance of the cat achieving remission. And so my first instinct is to always go ahead and start insulin immediately. I'm going to reach for a long-acting formulation, and so my preferred insulin is insulin glargine U100 or Lantus. Other choices that may be appropriate, personal, personal preference, and protamine zinc insulin is certainly a popular choice with many feline practitioners. Some individuals use insulin detamir or levomir. There's also been some work done recently looking at insulin glargine U300 called Tujeo. So this is an extremely concentrated glargine product. Um, it does look as though it may be a very useful product for cats. Because the insulin is very concentrated, it leaves the subcutaneous tissues very, very slowly. Um, and some preliminary work suggests it may be a suitable once a day option for our feline diabetics. We're going to start our dosing plan based on our cat's ideal body weight. And so that's generally about one unit per cat twice daily. And we're going to plan to give this insulin twice, twice daily. As I said, the Tujeo, the U300 glargine, may go once daily, um, but the work on that is still relatively new. One thing that is important is to remember that we do need to make dose changes slowly because the body has to adapt, and because particularly for insulin glargine that leaves the subcutaneous tissues very slowly, it's going to take a few days to see the full impact of a dose increase. And so I never step up the glargine more than once every three days. Other thing we have to do is go ahead and reverse that insulin resistance. And so if the cat is overweight, we need to make an effective weight loss plan. So we're usually looking at a 2% decrease in body weight per week, which is about 0.4 kilos in a 5 kilo cat. I think it's really important to um, create a very, very clear weight loss program so we can tell that we're staying on track. You also want to make sure that we address issues like concurrent dental disease very promptly because the inflammation in an upset mouth is going to antagonize our insulin. I know some individuals tend to think we should stabilize the diabetes and then address the dental disease, but that's not my philosophy. My philosophy is to go ahead, start the insulin, and as soon as you possibly can, and the cat will not be regulated, but as soon as you possibly can, safely anesthetize the cat, go ahead and deal with a bad mouth and then focus on trying to achieve glycemic control. And again, I would also reach for what I would regard as the most appropriate dietary choices for our feline diabetics as part of my plan for remission. So that would be a diet where less than or equal to 14% metabolizable energy is coming from carbohydrates. And there is good evidence that wet food has some advantages as far as water intake and feelings of satiety. It's also very difficult to find a dry food that meets the ideal nutritional requirements. It's okay though for a cat to eat little and often. Cats have a very, very um, long, flat postprandial phase and so cats don't need to necessarily be meal fed. It's perfectly fine if the cat basically snack browses throughout the course of the day. 
we've talked about the journey to diabetes mellitus, we've talked about diet and incretins, we've talked about diabetic remission. There's just a few more things I wanted to share before I wind things up today. So I do want to wind back, um, back to the glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. So I talked about its powerful trophic effect on those beta cells and the fact that it suppresses appetite. So I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that GLP-1 analogs are routinely used in people with type 2 diabetes mellitus. They're going to support and restore beta cell function. They're going to improve insulin sensitivity. They encourage modest amounts of weight loss and have essentially zero risk of hypoglycemia. So there are really, really superior treatment choice compared to reaching for insulin. And one of these GLP-1 analogs, Xenotide XR or Bidurian, has been studied in cats. Does have some interesting promise, maybe something we reach for in the future. Another thing I wanted to share with you is there's been some very preliminary work done looking at once weekly insulin therapies for cats using recombinant feline insulin. So these are tremendously exciting new products that are in the pipeline and maybe in our hands in a few years. The idea behind this new feline insulin is ingenious. Essentially, a molecule of feline insulin has been connected to a fragment of an antibody. Because it's connected to a fragment of the antibody, the antibody is then picked up by antigen-presenting cells. And this basically holds the insulin back until it is very, very, very slowly released. In the small number of cats who've been treated with this, the results were comparable or maybe even slightly better than cats on more traditional insulin protocols. So very, very exciting news. There's also some information I wanted to share with you. Maybe you've seen these, but if you haven't, well worth a read. And so in 2015, the International Society for Feline Medicine published consensus guidelines on the management of diabetes mellitus in cats. Um, slightly outdated, um, five years is a long time in the world of diabetes, but still an excellent resource and one I think you can very easily share with your, with your cat owners. And then in 2018, AHA redid its diabetes guidelines for both dogs and cats. Very, very useful resource and one again that I think should be on everybody's, everybody's shelf. And then the American Association of Feline Practitioners created a diabetes educational toolkit um, about a year or so ago. This includes some, some comments about treatment and diagnosis and frequently asked questions and some very useful resources for clients. This is an open access website. You do not need to be a member of the American Association of Feline Practitioners to get access. Um, very, very useful for practitioners and again, some very, very useful resources for cat owners. So I'd be very, very happy to uh, answer any questions. My email is here, and so if you're shy and would rather answer a question by email later, you are welcome to email me directly. And then I think we'll, um, we'll have a couple minutes to see if any questions have come through um, on the chat. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cook, and thanks everybody for submitting. We have some good questions that have come through. Uh, I do want to, again, put in uh, a call for please donate um, to our Cures for Cats campaign, uh, looking at finding answers for feline diabetes. Uh, I do find that I'm a huge supporter of the campaign, and certainly when we uh, did this a few years ago on kidney disease, we were able to raise a, enough funds for four studies on kidney disease, so we can definitely make a difference, I think, in this area for feline diabetes. And, and please text um, GIVE to 973-834-7194. Seven one nine four, and every dollar that you give is matched dollar for dollar up to fifteen thousand dollars. And um, I always consider my four kitties here the fact that they sit on my lap or my chest or whatever. It's it's a worthwhile gift back to them uh, for being part of our family. I do want to thank Ken for uh, mentioning that. Uh, Wynn does participate in Amazon Smile, so this is the season. If you order anything from Amazon or through the, uh, throughout the year, uh, select Win as your uh, charity, and we will receive a certain percentage of funding from that. So uh, 
very beneficial and thank you Ken and you can donate through our website winfelinefoundation.org um, so plenty of options to help give back uh, for the health of cats and so I will go into asking these questions uh, do cats have an inflammatory response to elevated levels of insulin similar to humans uh, I will probably reverse that so in inflammatory diseases will tend to cause insulin resistance and that will cause increased insulin concentrations before you become a diabetic and so yes there's a strong con connection between inflammation and insulin concentrations but I think it's the inflammation that drives the insulin resistance and then drives the need to make more insulin to get the job done and so that's how I would explain that relationship Thank you. Um, next question, it says, Howdy and Gigum from Westcliff, Colorado. Do you have any input or guidance for those wishing to implement a raw diet for cats? Ooh, that's a great question. So from a nutritional perspective, um, there's lots of great things to say about raw diets. And if I could open my back door and catch from my cat every day a mouse and a shrew and a bunch of lizards um, and a frog, and a bird, it would be fantastic. I think metabolically, raw diets are awesome. The fear that most of us have about raw diets is you can't do that. You can't open your back door and catch these things, and so you're purchasing um, raw foods, and that does make me nervous. Um, and so I would tend to, I personally tend to shy away from raw food diets. I do think some of the raw food concepts that have been sterilized in some way um, are less concerning from a environmental contamination, the risk of salmonella, those kind of issues. But I think the nice thing about diets that are the raw food construct is they tend to be very, very low in carbohydrate. And so I, I'm conflicted. I love them nutritionally. I just worry about them from a, is it really raw? And then we're going to have problems with, we're bringing things into our house that might have salmonella and, and cause human health concerns. And so I think there's a place for that diet construct as long as we're very cognizant about hygiene and recognize too that a cat can't simply live on nothing but dried salmon and so they do have to be diets that are going to meet all of the cat's needs and need to be effectively balanced but as far as trying to shoot for raw carbohydrate um, for low carbohydrate there's lots to be said for that philosophy the next question uh, was covered a bit in your talk uh, I will before I have to read it out, uh, let people know that we will be having next year in January, and I guess 2021 is right around the corner, a uh, webinar on dental disease in cats and stomatitis. So keep, keep looking for the information about that. But the question is, could you tell us more about the relation of stomatitis and dental problems with diabetes? So it's a great question. I do think it's a I do think it's a significant driver for insulin resistance. And so when we think about the things that make insulin less efficacious, cytokines, the inflammatory mediators, play a key role. And insulin is not just like putting a key into a lock and opening a door and letting glucose in. Insulin attaches to the receptor on the cell and then a whole slew of complex, tiny metabolic processes have to happen in order for us to then get the response that we're wanting. And cytokines will block some of those steps. To me, that the simplest analogy is if you think about some elaborate piece of clockwork and someone's just sprinkling sand into that clockwork, it's going to be much more difficult for that clockwork to turn. And cytokines are like throwing sand in your clockwork. So any source of chronic inflammation, and for a cat, the mouth is a classic spot, that is like throwing sand in the clockwork, and it's going to make the cat insulin resistant, and that's going to make it more predisposed to diabetes mellitus. And so I'm a huge believer in um, routine, preemptive, effective dental care for cats. But if you look at a cat that you think might be verging on Coming a diabetic and the mouth is is nasty. Um, don't don't be casual about it. Don't don't calmly suggest a dental. Sit down with the owner and say, we need to deal with this mouth because this is going to put your cat at risk for becoming a diabetic. And let's get the teeth cleaned up and let's think about what the foods are that he's eating and let's think about hitting our ideal body weight and our ideal muscle condition score and see if we can avert the day that your cat ever becomes a diabetic. But the simplest way to think of it is those inflammatory cytokines, honestly, like just putting sand in your clockwork. That's kind of sort of how I think about inflammation and insulin sensitivity. Thank you. 
Uh, next question is, my cat is on prednisolone for IBD. How often should I check his blood sugar or blood glucose? It's been below 200 for months. That is a good question. If your cat needs the steroids to stay well, then you somewhat, to some extent, you just have to face that there's an increased risk of diabetes mellitus. If the blood sugar, though, is, is over 130 but less than 200, then that, that would suggest the pancreas is under significant stress. So a few things I would think about. Um, pay attention to body condition score. That might be low already if your cat's struggling with inflammatory bowel disease. Be cognizant about the food choices you make because if your cat is not needing a specific diet for the IBD, um, could you switch your cat to something that might be a bit more pancreas friendly like a lower carbohydrate wet food? Um, other thing I would think about is um, could you substitute the prednisone for something like chlorambucil to reduce the steroid dependency? So those are some management strategies. Otherwise, I would say probably every three or four months, unless I saw a change in my cat's behavior, I would keep an eye on blood sugar and maybe measure a fructosamine every now and again to kind of get a baseline idea of what that is because sometimes the fructosamine will start to drift a little bit upwards before the cat becomes overtly diabetic. So those would be my kind of management strategies for this. But it, it's difficult. If you've got a cat that needs steroids, you've got a cat that needs steroids, and sometimes you just have to take the risk of the diabetes. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from a, a big cat lover and a cat specialist. And some grain-free diets have very high glycemic index carbohydrates. Does the glycemic index of the individual carbohydrates influence the cat's response to diet carbohydrate content? Yeah, that, that's a that's a that's a that's a great question. So I, I do think we can use the idea of the glycemic index. It's kind of a human idea, but I do think we can put it over to um to feline medicine. Um, and certainly, if you think about carbohydrates, you've got the idea about kind of people who do the Atkins style diet talk about net carbs. And so um, many fibers are listed as a carbohydrate, but they're not absorbed, and so they're not actually uh, a carbohydrate that's going to impact our glycemic regulation directly. And certainly, um, I do think that some of the grain-free diets that are using carbs that have a high glycemic index potentially are really not good choices for cats. Cats really are not expecting to have glucose come across their GI tract in substantial amounts. They don't have the endocrine responses that are designed for it. So they don't get the same heads up to their pancreas that basically sugars are coming in. They really are not biologically well designed to be on high carbohydrate diets. And so um, I don't know that the work has been done, but based on my kind of global understanding about the glycemic index construct in people, um, it seems imprudent to have a cat on a robust carbohydrate diet that has a particularly high glycemic index. I think you are doing that cat um, no favors from a beta cell function perspective. That cat is more likely to have a postprandial hyperglycemia than a cat who's on a diet that's not got those same characteristics. So um, I would definitely share some concerns about that approach. Sounds like a uh, potential hypothesis for a, a clinical study. health study <laughs> down yes. the way for us there. Next question is, what's your opinion on the diagnosis of preclinical diabetes or prediabetes in cats? Do you use insulin to glucose ratio? And then it's HOMA or Quickie, H-O-M-A, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So Homer is it's, Homer is basically it's a it's an insulin to glucose ratio, and it's a way to try and measure insulin sensitivity. There's been some publications looking at it in cats um, and dogs. Not nearly as well validated in cats and dogs as it is in um, in the human perspective, and so I do not routinely do um, those ratios in cats. I, I've done them for experimental purposes in dogs and cats. I've never done them from a clinical perspective. Again, I would love to actually look at a bunch of cats with dental disease, look at their markers of glucose homeostasis, like their HOMA before and after they get their dental disease addressed. That would be a wonderful way to prove the impact of bad dental care and bad dental disease on their ability to, um, to, to effectively regulate their carbohydrate metabolism. So another, another great study that we could fund, which would be, that would be fascinating. Um, so I don't, so if I see a cat and it comes in for something else, it's coming in to, um, of course everything I see is sick for some other reason. So I can't imagine a wellness visit for a cat because I don't do wellness visits. But if I did a wellness visit for 
a cat and its body condition score was a six out of nine and its muscle condition score was on the disappointing side and if you're not muscle condition scoring I would urge everybody to start adding that to part of their of their standard database on on every visit and then I got a blood sugar that was 180 I'd be very concerned that cat is um, is pre-diabetic now it, it could be that it was just stressed. I mean, cats always have that aha of I was just unhappy and I, that you should not overread my resting blood glucose. But I think there's nothing to be lost by looking at that cat and saying, I think you've got some flags for pre-diabetes. And then it's a great chance to have a conversation with an owner about, hey, blood sugar is out of the reference range. I'm not panicking and your cat's not a diabetic. But your cat's got some risk factors for diabetes and we should take this very seriously. So that's usually, that's how I tend to think about it. And that would be the approach I'd recommend is, to me, it's a great discussion point. Um, whether the cat was simply stressed or not, if the cat's BCS is, is, is bigger than it should be, its muscle score is not great, it's maybe on um, uh, an inexpensive store brand diet to dry food that's high in carbohydrates, it's maybe not a great choice. This is a great opportunity to have a really meaningful conversation with the cat owner and just share some things with them that maybe they simply were not aware of. I think many of our owners don't understand that the foods we choose to give our cat and the amount of foods we choose to give our cat have such such impact on their um, on their well-being and their longevity. So to me, it'd be a conversation starter. Um, it's a great question about doing HOMA, but I've only done that for uh, for for science, not for not for day-to-day -day management. But that's a great question. Thank you again. Uh, regarding Freestyle Libre, do you have any advice on how to interpret the AGP graph in cats? Do we need to stand on what is published in people? Hopefully, you know, the study that's underway uh, that wins funding might give us more information on that, but I'll so turn I, that over to you. Yeah, I wasn't sure. The part of that question was about, I didn't quite catch it, that the can you Regarding um, on the Freestyle Libre advice on how to interpret the graph, the AGP graph for so what, cats. Yeah, I'm not getting what that what the graph is. The ADP graph. AGP. I assume they're talking about oh, the um, average blood glucose. You know, the readout okay. day by okay. day. I I would assume. Okay, so um, so usually when I'm looking at the Freestyle Libre data. Um, I care about kind of what the average blood glucose was. Um, with my goal of keeping it below 200 and then I care about what the nadir was. Now what's interesting when you start putting freestyle libres on patients um, both dogs and cats is how how common subclinical hypoglycemia is in our patients. Um, we just we're not picking it up on our spot checks in the hospital um, or our spot checks at home and now with freestyle libres it's amazing to me how often um, very well controlled dogs and cats spend um, chunks of their day at values that would have been a little bit surprising had I caught them in the clinic. And so in that sense, I, I, and I don't tend to panic. So if the blood glucose goes down to say 65, um, if I was doing a curve, I would have decreased their insulin dose. If I'm looking at their Freestyle Libre data and that's as low as it got and I know that and the cat had no clinical signs of hypoglycemia, then I will tend to run with it. And so it's, um, I, I do tend to use the data a little bit differently because it gives me so much more information than I would get from a from a single curve or two or three spot checks at home. Um, and so in that sense, I think I do use the data differently. And I probably will tolerate modest, transient hypoglycemia documented on Libre that I would not have tolerated if I'd got it as a, as a one-off value. Um, as far as other ways I use the data, one of the things that's useful to me is to look at the day-to-day -day variability because if you find that the days are remarkably different, like it's all over the place, Monday is different from Tuesday, is different to Wednesday, then that to me is a clue that maybe this insulin is not a good choice for this cat, this insulin is too variable on this individual, or there's other things in the management of the cat that, that are inconsistent that I need to talk to the owner about. And so is the feeding practices inconsistent? Um, is there something else that's going on that's, that's making tremendous variability day to day? Because you're gonna get some variability, but if it's really all over the place, then that to me often makes me think this insulin's not a good choice or there's something happening at home. And so seeing to me what Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday looks like compared to each other is tremendously powerful. I think the Freestyle Libre, when they work, and they don't work on everybody, 
I would say eight times out of ten I'm thrilled and two times out of ten I'm a bit frustrated um, but when they work I think they're they're an incredibly useful tool and it's such an inexpensive way of gathering really valuable data yeah I notice in people they're talking about time and range more and more um, as a way to you know how people are doing um, graphing that out and as you said you know just on balance you know for them be curious to see how that goes for for pets dogs and cats you know too so uh, just a few more questions uh, let's see what is the proper ratio of protein and fat in the nutrition so um, I, now I'm, this is very, very crude, but if I'm looking at um, protein concentration, I'm usually looking for a diet that's 40% protein. So 40 is kind of my, that's a good number. Um, what's difficult when you're looking at um, the bag is the, there's, you have to, it can be complicated to convert information on a bag or a can to, to actually percentage metabolizable energy um, and that's often the feature that we're looking for and so I'm usually thinking in terms of about 40% um, protein um, usually about 40% fat and then I'm trying to get my carbs down to you know less than 14% and so those are the kind of numbers that I'm looking at but again I don't want to talk kind of apples to oranges because um, how we look at the information that's on the bag versus the actual um, metabolizable energy is slightly different and sometimes the information on the bag is actually a little bit misleading um, but 40% protein is a really good target to look for. If you're sending a client to a grocery store and saying, pick up a good quality, um, high protein food, then that's a good number to bear in mind as a 40% um, protein. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is your definition of a transient diabetic? Is that a cat in remission? And yes. great presentation comments. Oh, oh, thanks very much for that. So um, the suggestion from the Gastello paper from 2014 is that we should define remission as a cat who, who maintains euglycemia for at least four weeks without exogenous insulin. So that is my, that is my cat gone into remission. That is my diabetic cat in remission because I still think that cat is diabetic. It's just a diabetic cat in remission. Um, and so I talk about a cat having transient diabetes mellitus. That's what we'll tend to think about. But, but some people think that a cat that's gone into remission is no longer diabetic. I tend to think that they are. And so maybe transient diabetes isn't a good phrase to use versus saying this is a diabetic cat in remission. You can think of it more, I think, in, in terms of how um, human oncology talks about patients with certain cancers. They'll say, I have X cancer, I'm in remission. I think we need to think about these cats who no longer require exogenous insulin as diabetic cats, comma, in remission, but they still basically have the disease. And so um, some people say, oh, it's a transient diabetic because the, the blood sugar um, was able to be controlled eventually without the need for insulin, but other of us would say that cat is still a diabetic. So it's a little bit semantics. The last question um, is, can you please uh, share your email address again? Uh, yes, let me see if I can go backwards. Can I go backwards? Yes, there it is. Hopefully you guys can see that. So my email address is up there and you are, um, you're welcome to shoot me um, uh, an email if you've got a question pertinent to the, to the talk. Thank you, Dr. Cook. And it looks like we went through from what I could see all the questions, uh, excellent questions and appreciate the support. And, and uh, again, if you can still text to give, uh, text give to 973-834-7194 or uh, go on Wynn's website, winfelinefoundation.org and give to our Cures for Cats campaign. Uh, but thank you so much for attending and uh, you know keep up the good work as being cat lovers and supporters of win I second all of that thank you very much for your interest